Praise the Lord. This is the day that the Lord hath made. We yeah, will yeah. rejoice and be glad in it. Yeah, Praise yeah. God. Today is Father's Day. And we just want to say happy Father's Day to all of the fathers. Yeah. It's not happy baby daddy day. Uh, it's all you who are fathering your children. Amen. Amen. Participating in your children's life. And we're, we're just uh, blessing you and, and wishing you a happy day today. Amen. Praise God all of you that are here and those of you that are joining uh, later on YouTube. We, we bless you in the name of the Lord. It is good to see uh, Sister Olivia, all the way here from out of town. Amen. Amen. We're kind of holding her hostage here in the city of Brotherly Love. <laughs> but she's not arguing or complaining about it. And we thank God for her and, and all of you uh, who are here today. Amen. Amen. We've been doing a series called, we call it The Mysteries of Heaven. And uh, we are going to disguise part three uh, in a Father's Day message. Uh, so turn with me uh, to John chapter 14. It seems we've been covering around John chapter 14 for a couple of months now, actually. Uh, uh, and today's message, or today's little talk, will be in my father's house. Yeah. In my father's house. Yeah. Amen. John chapter 14. Your Bible, we go there almost every week, so your Bible will probably just fall <laughs> over to that page by now. John chapter 14, beginning at the very first verse, and it reads, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whether I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Thomas said unto him, Lord, we know not whither thou goest. How can we know the way? Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, you should have known my father also. Mm -hmm. And from henceforth ye know him and have seen him. Philip said unto him, Lord, show us the father, mm -hmm. and it suffices us. <laughs> Jesus said unto him, Have I been so long time with you, mm -hmm. and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the father. And how saith then, thou then, show us the Father? Mm -hmm. Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me. Yeah. He doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very works' sake. Verse 12, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me and the works that I do shall he do also, and greater works than these shall he do, because I go unto my Father. And whatsoever ye shall ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If ye shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. Amen. Praise the Lord. So, uh, as I was reading over this, I, it just kind of jumped out at me three points, just like any good Baptist preacher, three-point sermon. Uh, <laughs> so, we're just going to uh, uh, give you these three points and let you go so you can be first in the buffet line because the salad bars are open. Wow. <laughs> Great to be free. Don't you love being in a free country? Amen. Praise the Lord. I once was bound, but now I'm free. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Yeah, as I was driving to church today, I saw uh, one guy at the bus stop had a shirt on and said, retired slave. And he had this great big mask on his face. And said, Brother, you don't even know. You're not retired yet. <laughs> no, no offense. But it's outside by himself. <laughs> uh, okay, I'm sorry. I won't go there. Uh, number one, there, 
There are three things here. Number one thing, uh, there are things that Jesus wanted his disciples to know. Things that Jesus wanted his disciples to know. Uh, number one, he wanted to let them know that he was the son of God. In this passage, he's emphasizing son and father. When there's a father, there's got to be a son. Where there's a son, there's got to be a father. And so he wanted them to know that he was the son of God. And, and we've mentioned elsewhere in John, way back in John chapter uh, 3, uh, he talks about the son of man. John chapter 1, he talks about the son of man. So Jesus is not only the son of man, but he's the son of God. Oh, yeah. And I know you know, because I've told you repeatedly, and, and, and if you tell someone something long enough, they'll, they'll believe it. Uh, uh, I told you that whenever he says son of man, he's saying that anyone else who is a son of man can do what I just said, no matter how uh, different or contrary to what you feel like you are able to do. So Jesus called himself son of man so he could be relatable to us as mere sons of men. Most of us had a father and a mother that uh, constructed us. Uh, they might not have been always apparent or visible in our life, but you know, most every human being has both a father and a mother, or a petri dish. But anyway, um, Jesus here is talking. He wants them number one to know that I am the Son of God. Yeah. The second thing is right in the very first couple of words of the the passage. There, he said. There's no need to fear. He, this is actually a command. Whenever there's a verb with no subject in front of it, the subject is you. And whenever it's you plus a verb, it's a command. You stop. Yeah, right. You let not your heart be troubled. Jesus is commanding his disciples, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. No matter what you hear, no matter what people are saying, and even, he's telling his disciples, don't even be afraid of what I'm about to tell you. I'm going away. Don't be afraid. Lord. Yeah. These are things that Jesus wants, wanted his disciples to know, and he wants you to know. He's yeah. the son of God. He doesn't want, he commands you, don't be afraid. The third thing here is, he wants us to know there is a place or position of authority in the house or the kingdom. So he said, in my father's house, and there, there are, are uh, several definitions, well, three or four definitions uh, in the Bible dictionary of what it means to be a house, but one of those definitions, it's not the first definition, but the, one of the ones further down, the house means my kinship, those rela related to me. You know, in England, they have what they call the House of Windsor, those, all those folks that are related to Queen Elizabeth and, and, and Prince Charles. They're all of the house of Windsor. It's their last name. And so he's saying, in my father's house, all those that are related to me and my father, in my father's domain, relationship, king, uh, kindred, he said there are many mansions. Well, that word mansion there uh, is translated as, further down again, rooms or residencies. Now, whenever I see the word residency, see, I've worked in a hospital for over 30 years. And whenever I see a residency, I think of the poor slob that has, is paying, getting paid very little, but spends much of his life there learning and teaching and doing a job all at the same time. And so I said, well, could this apply here? Are we going to be residents? And you know what? We can never, somebody said, when I get to heaven, I'm going to know it all. Guess what? You will never know it all. No, you're wrong. Uh, the Bible says God is past finding out. But he's not saying that so you won't learn. You will be forever learning, forever getting to know God. They said there's four living creatures going around the throne, going holy, holy, holy. And they say every time they make a revolution and come around to the front, they see a new aspect of God that they didn't see before. That's why their holies can be remain fresh. Can you imagine walking around saying holy, holy, holy for thousands of years? You get pretty bored after about five minutes. But when they come around again, holy moly, I didn't realize that. Oh, holy, holy goodness. Wow, that too? Wow, holy, wow, you're more amazing than I thought you were 10,000 years ago. And every time they circle around God, they see a new aspect of God that they never realized before, and they just are, are, are just amazed all over again. Holy, holy, holy. So that's how we're going to be in heaven. God says,
says, in my, among, for my kindred, among my family, he said, I'm, I'm setting up residencies for you where you will live forever and you will have positions in my kingdom. You will have a job and you will learn. Thank you. Somebody said, a job? <laughs> what do you mean a job? Now I've been in this multi-level marketing business and say job means just over broke. Yeah. They say you don't want a career, that you know what a career is? See a rear. No, that's not what I see. No, no, God has got a job for you that you will love. You know, you talk to a uh, uh, Tiger Woods and ask him what his job is. I play golf. Do you like golf? I love golf. Yeah, when they're not paying me, I'm out on the golf course hitting balls. Talk to LeBron James. What's your job? I play basketball. You play basketball? <laughs> yeah. I got two courts in my house, in my mansion. <laughs> That's the kind of job God is going to give you. He's got a job designed specifically and especially for you. And I'm telling you in advance, you're going to love it. Hallelujah. These are the three things I believe God, Jesus wanted them to know. He said, I am the son of God. And there is no need for you to be afraid because you too are the sons of God. You too are the children of God. And he's saying, he said, in my father's house, in, among all of my father's family, those who have accepted him as father, he said, he has provided for us an eternal residency where we can live with him, work with him, and learn with him forever. Mystery number three. Now, this is going to be one you said. The other one might have been a little shocking, but this one, you're going to say, oh, man, I've heard that before. I know that already. Mystery number three. Human beings are uniquely given the privilege to rule with the almighty God, their father. That is a unique privilege. 2 Timothy 2.12 says, if we suffer, we will also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. But here, where it gets really mind-blowing, in Hebrews 2, 5 through 18, I, I so badly wanted to read that whole chapter 2 of Hebrews. Uh, uh, the King James makes it a little tough to, to read it right off, but I'm going to read it in the New Living Translation. Just I'm going to spare you. I'm just going to read from verse 5 to verse 18. Hebrews 2, 5. And furthermore... It is not angels who will control the future world we are talking about. For in, in one place, the scriptures say, what are mere mortals that thou should think about them? Or a son of man that you should care for him? Yet for a little while you were made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. God has crowned men with glory and honor. Those, we're talking about the men who, who have accepted God as their father. He's crowned them with glory and honor. Verse 8. You gave them authority over all things. Now he's talking about God. God gave men authority over all things. Yes, yes. Wow. I thought I'd hear the sound of minds exploding, but no. uh, I guess you need another cup of coffee. Uh, uh, God has given mankind, think about, think about angels. There's an angel in the Old Testament. It said it slew like 170,000 men, one angel. One angel did that. The death angel killed, I don't know how many thousands, throughout Egypt. The death angel came through and killed the firstborn of everything. Cattle, uh, men, sheep, horses, everything. One angel. But God said, not to them. I didn't crown them with glory and honor. No, not them. That, that one that I made a little bit lower than the angels. When you were born, you were born a little bit lower than the angels. But I tell you, when you were born again, that excels you to higher than the angels. Then you become ground with glory and honor. And then God says, I have uh, set aside for you the authority over all things. Verse 8, I didn't finish reading. It gets more exciting. Now when it says, this is Hebrews 2, verse 8, New Living Translation. Now when it says all things, it means nothing is left out. You have authority over that anthill in 
your backyard that you're afraid to step on because all those ants will call up to your leg. You have authority over the ants. You have authority over the mouse that keep coming into your house. So I'm going to take my authority over those shooting guns on my street. I want to take authority over my mayor because I know his boss. My boss outranks my mayor. My boss outranks my governor. Yes. My boss outranks the president, the, the what they say, the most powerful man in the free world. My boss outranks him. Yes. Yes. Not only is he my boss, but he's my father. Yes. He's my dad. Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. Verse 9, what do we... Okay, uh, let me read verse 8 again since I chopped it up. You gave them authority over all things. Mm -hmm. Now when it says all things, it means nothing is left out. But we have not yet seen all things put under their authority. Mm. Now, I, I'm not going to put down the Bible. I believe it is in the inspired word of God. But I believe Hebrews was written to the Hebrews of that day. Now, we can, we can, we can uh, uh, modify the scriptures to uh, fit our lives today, right? Okay. I believe that we are in a day where God is beginning to release that authority yeah. to those that dare to believe, those that dare to seek him. Yeah. Back then, it hadn't been released. Mm -hmm. But now, today, as we shift into the kingdom age, Shifting out of the church age and into the kingdom age, God says, now, now that you're coming into the kingdom age, I have to establish my kingdom, and I need some folks to rule and to reign. I need to be able to release authority to my children. Wow. Amen, John. That was good. <laughs> yes. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Verse 9. What we do see is Jesus, for who a little while was given a position a little lower than the angels. And because he suffered death for us, he is now crowned with glory and honor. Yes, by God's grace, Jesus tasted death for everyone. Amen. He paid the price for your glory and your honor. He paid the price that you might have authority over all things. So Jesus had to go through all the suffering, all the torture, all the abuse, all the anguish. You had to go through none of it. He received all of it, and then he said, all power in heaven and earth is given unto me, and I'm going to share it with you, yes. my brethren. Jesus. Revelations. Thank you. Let's, well, let's first go to 1 John 3, 1 through 3. New Living uh, Translation again. See how very much our Father loves us, for he calls us his children. And that is what we are. But the people who belong to this world don't recognize that we are God's children because they don't know him. Dear friends, we are already God's children. But he has not yet shown us what we will be like when Christ appears. But we do know that we will be like him, for we shall see him as he really is. And all... And all who have this eager expectation, and all who have this eager expectation will keep themselves pure just as he is pure. Amen. So I, I, I quote this, this verse a lot, not in this translation necessarily, but I believe, see a lot of people believe that this, when, when Jesus comes in the rapture, we're going to be like Jesus in heaven. Well, let me tell you, this earth needs a lot more Jesus on it. I know you can turn on the radio and find someone preaching Jesus on the radio any time of the night or day. I know you can go on the internet, YouTube, and find someone preaching Jesus any time of the night or day. You can go into any, almost any bookstore now and find a Bible. You can turn on the TV or, and find someone preaching the gospel. But it seemed to me there are, there's never been a time when people have had so much Jesus preached all around them are still so ignorant of the word of God. Amen. I can stand up in a lot of churches and say, you know, you remember how Moses took all the animals on the ark two by two and the rains came and God delivered them all from the lion's den. And everybody will say amen and never see a problem with what I just said. Oh, I knew that was free. That wasn't in my notes. <laughs> <laughs> and 
that's somebody said it sounds like it. Uh, yeah, but God said God is revealing who Jesus is to us, and then he, at the same time He's revealing that we can be just like Jesus. So that's another song we'll be able to cross off our list. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus, no, not one. Then all of a sudden we have to stop singing that because wow, she's just like Jesus. He's just like Jesus. You know, I had a backache and I, I was telling her about it. She said, well, I'll just stop and pray. And she laid hands on me. And you know what? I haven't felt that pain since. Amen. Just like Jesus would have done. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Yes, Lord. You know, we were going by and we saw this car today. And she said, stop the car. Let, let's see what's going on. And someone was there bleeding. They thought they were going to bleed out. And she just said a little prayer. Stop bleeding. Jesus. In Jesus' name. Amen. And they stopped bleeding. And they seemed to recover, and the ambulance took them along, along and, and they thought they were not going to live, but they live. Wow, so I can't sing that song, There's Not a Friend Like the Lowly Jesus, because I'm seeing Jesus begin to pop up all around me. Amen. Thank you. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Revelations 5, 9 and 10, again in the New Living Translation. And they sang a new song with these words, Worthy, you are worthy to take the scroll and break its seal and open it. For you were slaughtered, and your blood was ransomed, has ransomed people. Let's start again. And they sang a new song with these words. You are worthy to take the scroll and break its seals and open it. For you were slaughtered, and your blood has ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. Verse 10. And you have caused them to be a kingdom of priests for our God. And they will reign on earth. They will reign on earth. The people of God will reign on earth. In the, in the future of this series, uh, coming up in a series, we'll, we'll expand upon uh, ruling and reigning. Uh, I don't mean to disappoint you, but uh, we're not going to live forever and ever in heaven. There's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. And a lot of us are going to live on earth. We're all always have access to heaven. But we're going to live on earth ruling and reigning. We'll get into that at another time. Today is Father's Day. We're talking about Father. So there, there are three things I said that God wanted or Jesus wanted them to know. He wanted them to know that he was the son of God. And he wanted to, them to know that they didn't need to fear. And he also wanted to know there is a place or position of authority in the kingdom for every one of you. But also, Jesus said, there's some things I've got to show. There's things I want you to know, but there's some things I've got to show you. And he wanted to show you, because they were, you know, it wasn't only Peter. Peter takes a lot of the heat, but here we, we see that the, the, the others were showing that they didn't, weren't entirely in tune with what Jesus was talking about. Thomas says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. Jesus just said, you know where I'm going, and you know the way. Thomas jumps right up and says, hey, I'm not trying to call you a liar or nothing, but I have no idea where you're going, and I don't know how to get there. Jesus said, I want to show you something. I am the way. I am the truth, and I am the life. There's something else he wanted to show you. He said, I want to show you the Father. Because Philip later says, it was Thomas, then it was Philip. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and everything will be cool. We'll be cool. You just show us God, the Father. And, you know, I don't know, but any father, you see, the Father, I know you know a little bit about, enough about biology to know that the Father doesn't carry the baby. And... <laughs> I know if you Google who can give birth, it doesn't say women. It says anyone can uh, because of political correctness and not wanting to offend the other 107 genders besides female. Uh, but anyway, truth be told, uh, because I had a couple of biology courses, I found out that only women uh, can carry the baby. So, so now, uh, so it could come into question for the father. Now, it's indisputable who the mother is. You know, you, if you had the baby, you, you can't question who the mother is. But sometimes a father may question. 
Um, I don't know. Uh, it was just a one night fling. If you have one night fling with me, you could have had one night fling with someone else, and somebody else could be the father. But then they said the proof is in the pudding. So when the baby comes out, it's not obvious immediately who the father is. But they can do a test for traits, mm -hmm. DNA. Mm -hmm. And then they can determine who the father is. I know you've all watched Mari Povich or whatever that guy's now is. Mm -hmm. You are the father. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus is saying, have I not so long been with you that you have not recognized the father? I am just like my father. If you have seen me, if you see how much I love, how I act, how I want to heal, how I want to cast out devil, how I want to set people free, how I want to break the religious spirit, if you see that in me, you have seen the Father because that's just how he is. Amen. Have you laughed with me, eaten with me, cried with me? He said, that's how the Father is. Yes. You have seen me, you have seen the Father. He said, that's what I want to show you. I want to show you the Father. He's not this big, uh, mysterious dude sitting on a throne with a lightning bolt in his hand waiting for you to mess up. Oh, they messed up. Zap! Yeah. No, no, no. He's got a wrong picture of the Father. He said, I want to show you the Father by the way I have lived, by the way I've demonstrated my life, the way I have laid down my life. That's how the Father is for God. So loved this world that he sacrificed his only son so that all of humanity can escape perishing Thank you, Lord. by just believing on Jesus Christ. Yes, Lord. Thank you. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. There's some things that Jesus wanted to show them. He said, I'm the way. Now you know how to get there. Because I'm the way. I am the truth. If, if there's no Jesus in it, it's just knowledge. But if Jesus is in it, then it's truth. You might get that later. There's another thing he wanted to show them. How to attain whatever is required for the journey. He said, let me show you how to obtain what you need. Simple. Ask the Father in my name. Go to Father God and say, Jesus said that I could have this. And God the Father said, I will not deny the name of my son Jesus. Jesus told his disciples, there's something I want you to know. I want you to know that I am the son of God. I want you to know that you don't have to fear. I want you to know that there is a place for you. There might not have been a place for you in your family. There might not have been a place for you in your job. And they said, we have to let you go. God said, it'll never happen. I will not let you go. If you leave, you've left on your own accord. But he said, there's always a place for you in the father's house. That's what he wants you to know. But he said, I want to show you that I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I want you to see the Father's love for you by looking at me, by examining my life. I want to show you the Father. And he said, I not only want to show you the Father, I want to show you where you get equipment to make this journey. Hallelujah. Thank you. Thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you. Yes. I was reading an article this week, and there, I forget what year it was. I don't know, it might have been 92 or it might have been 82 or 78 or some, one year before 2000. <laughs> NASA launched a, a, a space probe and it has finally reached the outer orbit of Pluto. Pluto, for those that may not know, is the furthest planet in our solar system. And they had determined before they said that how big the universe was and how many galaxies there are. There's like, I don't know, uh, 26 trillion, 26, not trillion, but the next one up, quadrillion uh, galaxies out there. And then now that they've got this, this probe, this camera, the data is finally beginning to come back all these years later. It took years to get out there. Now it takes, uh, uh, I don't know how long, for the signals to get back to Earth. And they're finding out that the galaxy or the universe has a lot of empty space where galaxies should be. Listen, you're not going to be bored with your job in heaven. God said, I'm saving a whole lot of work for you to do. They said 90% of the universe 
is void of the galaxies that it should have. I don't know, I'm just saying, maybe God wants you to create some galaxies. <laughs> you crazy? You crazy stupid or something? No. We know that uh, Jesus told a, 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 a parable and he said to the servants after they had made interest on what he had given them, he said, well done, thy good and faithful servant. And that's what we all say. We want to hear him say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. But we don't say the rest of the, what he said to those servants. We just say the beginning part. He said, you've been faithful over a few things. Come on up and I'll make you ruler over many things. Now in Luke 19, he goes a little further. He says, you've been faithful over little, but I'm going to make you rulers over cities. Because you're faithful, and, and Luke, I believe, says one pound. I don't know what that's worth, $2.43. Because you're faithful in that, one pound. He gave each of the, 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 the servants one pound. He came back and said, because you're faithful, because you showed a profit on that little bit that I gave you, I'm going to make you ruler over ten cities. I don't know, we might have the, rule, the, the, the mayor of Philadelphia for the uh, uh, millennial reign sitting right here in our midst. We, we might have the king of planet Earth sitting here. But God says, I'm going to put you over the cosmos to rule and reign. You're crowned with glory and honor. You're already seated in the heavenly places. All right, too much for Father's Day. But let me tell you, your father, if you're saved, your father is all that and a bag of chips. He is amazing. He never failed. He's a good, good father. That's who he is. So Jesus said, there's some things I want you to know. There's some things I want you to show. And lastly, so that you can get to the buffet line, he said, there's places I want you to go. Amen. Scripture, I, I told you I've been hearing almost every day, and it's continuing. I'm hearing it almost every day. 1 Corinthians 6, 17. He who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Uh, Jesus said here in John, he said, I will receive you that where I am mm -hmm. you can be also. Mm -hmm. Again, a lot of people believe that Jesus is coming back in the rapture, he's going to snatch us all away and we're going to go somewhere called heaven and live with him there. But as I'm reading this, I'm thinking about this uh, as we lived, our family uh, lived here in New Jersey, Pennsylvania area, and we would uh, go down to South Carolina quite frequently, all very often unannounced. We just show up, you know, dad knew the way. He was born there. He lived in the house a long time. That's where mama lived. You always know how to get to mama's house. Uh, but once in a while, every other year or so, they would make the hike up. And I don't know why they get around Baltimore someplace. Say, we don't know where we're going. <laughs> but we told you how to go. Can you come out and meet us? And sometimes we'd have to drive as far as like Chester on the 95 to meet them. And I believe this is what God is saying. He said, I will receive you. You start coming to me and I will receive you, and then we'll all go home together. I'll take you to places. He said, but you've got to start the trip, and I'll come and I'll receive you. Yes, salvation is a gift, but he said, I'm talking about stuff. I'm talking about responsibility. I've given you uh, this thing to work with. I've given you talents. I've given you abilities. And he said, I want you to work with them. And as you work with them, I will receive you and I will show you your rewards. Mm -hmm. The places you will go. How will we get there? I've been hammering this home. I, I know it's, it's a new concept, but it is throughout the Bible. Mm -hmm. We will travel to the destinations God has us initiated by our imagination. Imagine that. Jesus is like the Father. So then you begin to imagine Jesus. 
or without the Father because you know Jesus. Some of my friends at work try to imagine what my father's like mm -hmm. because they know me. I bet he's always telling dad jokes just like you. Mm -hmm. Well, not always. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the disciples now, they have a picture of who Jesus is, but it's, it's developed in their imagination. Uh, I said, I believe it was last week, I said, you know, I don't think that, that I can remember. I've ever heard anyone say the movie was better than the book. Almost always, if they have read the book, they say the book was better. Why? Because in the movie, it was someone else's imagination. And it's limited by comparison to your imagination. And so when you read the book and it's just describing it words, your mind builds the picture. And you want to be amazed and surprised. So you imagine the things that would amaze and surprise you. So Jesus says, I want to take you to a place. But it begins with your imagination. Why is that? Because uh, most Christians, the only scripture they know with, uh, that's about imagination says, talks about casting down the evil imagination. But if that's true, the opposite is also true. We're to raise up the pure and holy imaginations. Yeah. Uh, on the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus, he, he, he told them, uh, he was actually telling them the importance of their imagination. He said, if you sleep, if a man sleeps with another man's wife, he has committed adultery. That's what Moses said. But I'm telling you, if you have lusted after her in your heart, in other words, if you have imagined it and let that imagination play out in your mind, he said, you're guilty of the same thing. That's, Jesus is saying how powerful your imagination is. God says it, it's a trick of the enemy to tell you that you shouldn't be imagining things. You're not to be imagining evil things. Laying up late at night, thinking of how you can trick somebody or deceive somebody or steal some money from somebody without anyone knowing. No, those are evil imaginations that need to be cast down. But what we begin to imagine is that, God, how can I be a blessing? God, I wonder how could I get my whole neighborhood saved? God, I wonder what could I do to, to really bless your socks off? Oh, you're not wearing socks? Well, bless your sandals off. God, what can I do? What can I come? God, and you just start the wheels of your imagination turning. Jesus said, if you see me, you've seen the Father. That's your imagination. Not like the song John Lennon sings, Imagine. That's all the wrong imagining. He says, imagine there's no heaven. Imagine there's no hell. In the song he says, imagine there's no religion. Essentially, what he wants you to do is imagine there's no God. And you don't have, there's no such thing as right or wrong. You can you know, do whatever you want to do. That's what he's saying. That, that, that is actually demonic. So, yeah, I mean, next time it comes on, don't sing the lyrics if you if the song you grew up with. You might maybe you want to hum along, but don't sing the lyrics because that's not where you, how you want to use your imagination. Amen. But I'm going to say something that is contra contrary to what a lot of people say, and it might even sound a little contrary to what I have said. Religion is not entirely evil. Religion is actually a good starting place to find God. But once we've found God, we don't want to be religious. We want to have a relationship. So we take religion, that's man trying to find God. I'm lost, I'm undone, I don't know what to do, I need some help. That's religion, that's attempting to connect with God. But once you're connected, don't stay in the list of do's and don'ts. Okay, now that I've found God, what are the do's and what are the don'ts? That then becomes the bad part of religion. Do, thinking do's and don'ts will save you. Thinking do's and don'ts will cause you to have favor with God. That's when it becomes bad. We want relationship with God. Actually, every one of us in here today, if we're saved, we probably have heard the scripture that says, if thou can believe in thy heart, and confess with your mouth mm -hmm. the Lord Jesus, you'll be saved. Yes. 
You know what you've just done? You've just imagined a relationship with God. That's all you've done. Jesus did all the work. All you did was imagine. I'm imagining that I'm free. And then God makes it so because you've imagined it. Because you believed in your heart. That's imagining. Can we just take a time and imagine being in our Father's house in heaven? Imagine how we would behave and how we would act and how we would expect everyone else to act. You know, sometimes we are pretty mean ourselves because it's a defense mechanism because we expect everyone else to be mean. But if we're in heaven, we're going to expect everyone else to be nice, so we're going to be nice. So if we can live imagining that we are on, in heaven and just begin to be nice to people, uh -oh. it might begin to shift things. If we begin to imagine our neighborhoods better. You know, I, I see the cars coming down my street playing the loud music, boom, doodle, boom, doodle, boom. I'm watching them throw their old hamburger wrapper out the window right in front of my house. I'm just imagining it. And then it becomes so. Well, I said, you know what, God? I've got to start imagining that there's a force field of the glory of God on my street. It just oozes out of my house. And when they get there, they can't even speak through. they got to slow down in slow motion and just soak in the glory for a little bit. And all of a sudden, that bad thing they thought they were going to do, they're not going to do anymore. That, that curse that they were going to curse, they're not going to curse anymore. All of a sudden, they're thinking, well, you know what? Maybe there is something to this God thing. Maybe I, I need to, uh, uh, my mom's been telling me about uh, coming to church. Maybe I ought, just because they drove past my house, because glory is full. If I just laid in my bed and imagined a glory bubble. Imagine, not only God has been good to me, but just imagine my spirit expanding yes. Yes. and filling my room because I'm joined with the Holy Spirit. I'm joined with the Lord. I'm one spirit with him. So I know that I cannot contain God entirely, so I just imagine that my spirit is bubbling over out of myself all throughout my house. Yes. Yes. I've had people come into my house. I don't know what it is they say, but there's like peace here. What is it you do? Is it Febreze? <laughs> it's Jesus. That's it, Sister Wilson. It's Jesus. And then we have to start expecting that and imagining that for our, our neighborhood. And I know I've told this story probably a dozen times. One time we had a mother come down from Newark uh, to, to come. We, when I was growing up, we had our pastor had three churches, one in Newark, one in uh, Philadelphia, and one in Brooklyn. And they would have the morning service in Philadelphia, the evening service in Newark. And she came down from Newark to be with us in our morning service. And uh, brother and sister Giles would all often host those that came down from Newark. And we were invited after the morning service to come over to their house and have dinner. And, and her name was Mother McDade. She's gone on to be with the Lord now. And she was walking up the steps. And my dad runs up, holds the door open. And she just stops in the doorway and says, oh, Brother Blake, Brother Blake. Mm -hmm. She said, I just had a wonderful thought. Wouldn't it be wonderful if everybody was saved? <laughs> I said, I'll never forget that as long as I live. It was so funny. I'm hungry. I want to eat. You're stopping in the doorway to say that? <laughs> but I believe it was of the Holy Ghost. We've got to start imagining. And I imagine in my mind, yes, there's one and a half million folks in Philadelphia. Can I imagine what a hundred... 1.5 million folks who are saved in the same spot, the same town, all saved at the same time. If 120 people can call down the Holy Ghost and turn the city upside down and see 3,000 get saved, what could one and a half million people do? We could rock this world. Talk about getting lit, we'd be lit like, oh man, they have to change the definition of lit. Hallelujah. Somebody said, don't be Jesus. silly. Yeah. A whole city can't be saved. Yeah. 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 So have you heard yeah. Nineveh? Yes. Jesus. Jesus. Yes. Yes. If Nineveh can be saved, yes. Yes. in less than 40 days, yes. by one man doing what God told him to do, yes. Now, I know there probably wasn't one and a half million people in Nineveh, but if there were only 100,000, 
If one man could change a hundred thousand because he obeyed God and not even willingly obeyed God, God had to smack him upside the head to be obedient. And he's counting the whole time he did. He said, God, I know if I told them they would repent and you'd forgive them and have mercy on them. I don't even like these people. And you're such a merciful God. Guess what? If you begin to love your city, and cry out to God and do what God says to do. If you come to God in the morning and not rambling off all the things you want him to do for you today, say, God, what is it you'd like me to say and declare and do and pray? Hey. Help me to do those things. God, do, do you want to see my neighborhood saved? Yes. Yes. God might say, no, no, I want you to pray for Essington down in southeast Philadelphia. Jesus. I want you to pray for University City today. Okay. I know my turn's coming up. Yes. And as we see God begin to move because we're obedient, then we can say like the blind man, Sister Smith, said the other day, said, Why on others thou art calling God? I've seen how you blessed in this place and that place and the other place. But God, do you know I have a place too? God, why on others thou art calling? Please don't pass me by. Hallelujah. I know, I know. They're lining up at the, at the buffet even as we speak. Hallelujah. <laughs> So imagine being in your father's house. Imagine heaven on earth. Thy kingdom come and thy will be done. God says you prayed that for 2,000 years. I'm about to show up and bring my kingdom with me. Hallelujah. Because my people have said thy kingdom come. God, don't establish my kingdom. I don't want a kingdom. But I want your kingdom to come. And wherever you want me in your kingdom, that's where I want to be. Hallelujah. Thy kingdom come on earth just as it is in heaven. Don't you know the founding of the city of Philadelphia was William Penn's prayer. He said, I want this to be a holy experiment. I want Philadelphia to be a place of, uh, as it is in heaven, so it is in this territory called Philadelphia. So I'll name it the city of brotherly love because that's how it is in heaven. Everyone loving everyone. Imagine being a, a mature son. What a blessing that would be to our father. I know I've read this uh, quote by Albert Einstein last week. I'm going to read it again because it didn't make YouTube yet, but it will be. <laughs> Albert Einstein says, imagination is more important than knowledge, for knowledge is limited, whereas imagination embraces the entire world, stimulating progress, giving birth to evolution. We don't have to stay where we are. Well, well my, my grandmother prayed and fasted, and this is all she could do. Well, God said, There's, I'm pouring out more mercy, more grace. Yes, yes. But what you have to do is step into the Father's house. Jesus said, there's things I want you to know. I want you to know that I am the Son of God and that you don't have to fear. There's a place of authority in the Father's house for you. God said, there's some things I want to show you. you I want you, you to know that I am the way, I am the truth and the light. I want you to know that the Father is just like me. I want to show you how to obtain everything you need by asking of the Father in the name of the Son. And then he said, there's places I want you to go. I want you to go into the Father's house. I want you to ascend into the heavens. I want you to go where uh, your holy imagination will take you because the Holy Spirit will guide your imagination. Some of you will dream and see yourself on stage or, or, or teaching or preaching or reaching, healing the sick, raising the dead. Let your imagination go there. Don't listen to the lies of the enemy and tell you you're caught in pride. Say, no, no, I am a child of God. I'm crowned with glory and honor. I have the authority of the kingdom of heaven. I was made lower than the angels, but because I'm born again, I'm higher than the angels. Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. I better quit. Hallelujah. Oh, you better call ahead now uh, so you can get a place in the line. You don't want the... Mac and cheese to get hard. Uh, yeah, you want it while it's fresh. Amen. In my Father's house. In my Father's house are many mansions. In my Father's family, in my Father's uh, kinship, there are many places in a, of responsibility. There are many jobs and occupations. And God says, I've got one designed just for you. You know, this is the hour of deliverance, and deliverance is taking the land. 
But you first have to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And as I said in the sermon, it begins really with imagining your sins forgiven. Yeah. If you believe in your heart that the work that Jesus did on the cross of Calvary, you weren't there, you didn't see it. Nope. But you just have to imagine it. Yeah, God, you did do that. And you did it for me. And you confess that with your mouth. God says you're saved already. But don't stop your prayer there. Say, God, I want you to fill me with your Holy Spirit. Because you know what? I don't understand the things of the Spirit. I need your Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost, to help me to understand the things of the Spirit. So I'm not like Thomas or Philip or Peter or those folks in the Bible. When Jesus was speaking, they had no idea what he was talking about. But fill me with your Holy Spirit. And God, don't even stop there. I want the gift of speaking in other tongues that I can accelerate my growth in you and be all that you want me to be in a short period of time. Again, if you've done these things, ask Jesus to come into your heart, be the Lord of your life. Ask him to fill you with the Holy Spirit. Ask him to give you the gift of speaking in other tongues. Uh, you will be a child of God and eligible for everything that God promises in his word. God bless you. This is the hour of deliverance. Deliverance is taking the land. Until the next time, shalom. Yeah.